Thank you for that lovely introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Mic check. Do you know what that means? Yes? Occupy Pacifica, yes. So we're going to get around to the Occupy movement um, this afternoon, but I want to I wanna first thank Carol for asking me to turn my thoughts to the topic of leadership. Um, what I've written today is, is for this occasion um, and for really this moment that we find ourselves in where a social movement of great significance that has been long awaited is be blossomed last fall and is under development now. I want to make sure that you're sitting next to somebody that you can share some thoughts with. So if you need to move a chair now um, to do that or move your seat, please do that because I'm going to try to break twice so that you and your neighbor can exchange some thoughts. If you don't have a partner, raise your hand real quick so we can accomplish this in 15 seconds. Everybody partnered? No, we have... Raise your hand so you can get a partner if you don't have one. And, oh, okay, there's, can, can you move over? There? Okay, great. So th there's three parts um, of this talk, which is called Revolutionary Leadership from Paulo Freire to the Occupy Movement. The first part is called Recovering the Commons. Mistrust, disappointment, disillusionment, and anger mark our current relationship to leaders. The exercise of excess power, including violence, to satisfy rapacious desires for further power, prestige, privilege, and wealth have bled away the lifeblood, the needed nutrients for a decent life from the majorities. Lies, manipulation, corruption, and deceit have betrayed and marred our hopes for forms of leadership for the common good. The raping of resources, including the labor of human beings, from one place and its inhabitants for the benefit of another much smaller set of people in another place is familiar to us from colonialism. But now it is threatening the sheer viability of the entire planet. People, animals, rivers, oceans, the deep bowels of the earth, the soil itself, the air we breathe. These rapes have led to dizzying economic divides, now publicized by the Occupy Movement's discourse of the 1% and the 99%. It is no secret that stark income divides contribute to poor health, diminish lifespan, increase violence, paucity of community life, and increase mental illness. As those among us lose access to education, medical care, employment, and adequate shelter and food, societal demoralization sets in. We find ourselves and or those nearby us increasingly living in what Brazilian João Biel calls zones of abandonment, which accelerate the death of the unwanted through a form of economic Darwinism that authorizes the lives of some while disallowing the lives of others, says Giraud. For many, it no longer seems possible that reforms within our existing systems will adequately respond to and redress the growing misery wrought by the greed of immoral leadership and its attendant wars and violence that secure a perilous and widening income abyss. Hannah Arendt defi defined revolutionary times as those that reach a point where we have to admit that the body politic can no longer be restored to its initial integrity, and that, quote, an entirely unexpected and very different task of constituting something entirely new is upon us. There are diverse goals for leadership that lead to quite disparate descriptions of the necessary qualities of leaders. Behind me, I'm going to be showing you some posters and moments from Occupy. Um, this one, it, the lights came down a little bit, you'd see is Cornell West. So there are many, many <laughs> different descriptions of leadership, but oftentimes we're not being very clear about what the goal of leadership is in a particular context. So here I want to be very clear that I'm concerned with leadership that aids in healing profound income divides, 
and the vertical relations of power that create and protect them. I'm concerned with leadership that enables us to, quote, recover the commons. This is a term that is invoked in the Occupy movement and its sister revolutions worldwide. But to what does it refer? And what new concepts and rationalities does it require of us? I went to some meetings in Zakoti Park that were called um, Recovering the Commons, and I found that most of the people there didn't understand the history behind the commons. So I've written this next part um, with that in mind. Poet and environmental activist Gary Schneider describes the commons as an ancient mode of both protecting and managing the wilds of self-governing regions. The land belonged to the local community and was both used and cared for to promote the common good. Snyder says, quote, the commons is a level of organization of human society that includes the non-human. The level above the local is the bioregion. End of quote. When a piece of land or water was considered part of the commons, it did not mean that everyone could take from the common resource as much as he or she wanted. Access was regulated so that the commons was protected from the excesses of individual exploitation. Being a part of the commons involved mutual obligations of stewardship, obligations between people as well as between people and the local natural system. The practice of the commons in England was disrupted during the 15th to the 19th centuries by the enclosure movement. Land was stolen from community stewardship using John Locke's treatise on property to justify it. Locke linked individual freedom with the freedom to own through labor the land, forest, and rivers. Village held land was fenced off and privatized, disrupting sustainable communal agriculture. In the 18th century, many people had to leave the countryside for the urban areas because they could no longer sustain themselves through their relationship to the land. These rural homeless were the first members of the industrial working class. Throughout the world, the seizure of the commons by central governments, corporations, and individual entrepreneurs has led to collapses of local cultures, human and animal the loss of sustainable farming practices, and the degradation of the soil, forests, and water. Snyder says, quote, it is clear the loss of a local commons heralds the end of self-sufficiency and signals the doom of the vernacular culture of the region. He and many others call for a recovery of the commons, quote, people's direct involvement in sharing, in being, in being the web of the wild world. The logic and the ethics of the commons is different from that of the market or the state. Vandana Shiva, Indian eco-feminist philosopher and activist, in speaking of water rights, says that they are natural rights that, quote, do not originate with the state. They evolve out of a given ecological context of human existence. When this is not honored, the poor are excluded from their share of water. The water of whole regions is siphoned off for excess financial gain elsewhere, denuding the ecosystem which deprives the people, creatures, and plants living there of a necessary resource for thriving and surviving. Shiva suggests several principles underpinning water democracy in the context of recovering the commons. Developing a sensitivity to how we experience a mutuality with nature in which we know we owe our own well-being to it. That all species and ecosystems have rights to existence. That we have a duty to ensure our actions do not cause harm. That selling natural resources for profit violates our inherent right to nature's gifts and denies the poor of their rights that we have a duty to conserve and use water sustainably within ecological and just limits, that no one has the right to overuse, abuse, waste, or pollute water. To do otherwise is to disrupt the gift from nature that water is, she says. It is to act against the sacred. Protection of vital resources, she says, demands a recovery of the sacred and a recovery of the commons. 
Recovery of, co of commons requires participatory democracy and cooperative community participation, where people have the opportunity to become sensitized to each other's genuine needs and the needs of the natural world. The commons movement attempts to support local communities that still have commons while encouraging other local communities to develop commons, replacing corporate and privatized control with local communal, communal ownership. It uses the term commons to refer not only to shared ownership and stewardship of resources, such as land and water, but of knowledge, language, spiritualities, information, and community infrastructure. Sadly, even government is named as a lost commons, corrupted by the money of corporate lobbying or hijacked by dictators. The loss of the commons is inseparable from the reign of relationships marked by domination, oppression, violence, exploitation, and usurpation. To recover the commons, we must reorient ourselves to one another. In the Occupy movement, the commons was symbolized by the encampments in public spaces, by the taking back of the right to occupy our cities and the town's public squares. These occupations symbolized other needed occupations, such as the need to occupy the insufficiently regulated banking and financial systems, to help homeowners occupy their homes, foreclosed not due to their own short Comings, but to the rigging of the mortgage market and illegal foreclosure practices. The occupation of our educational system so that young people do not exchange formal education for debtor status in an economy that is failing through no fault of their own. And the occupation of our food system so that food security can be achieved. Many of those who occupied the encampments felt a deep sense of loss and subsequent mourning when the camps were forcibly destroyed by orchestrated efforts of the state. While not entirely utopic spaces, they had become, in Mary Belinke's words, public home places. Occupiers had co-created a rare sense of solidarity, of shared meanings and aspirations, of relationships march, marked largely by inclusivity, mutuality, generosity, and the common purpose for the good of the many. Sharing food that was available to any who needed it, setting up medical services, counseling and listening stations, establishing a common library, creating security forces armed with mediation techniques to diffuse conflicts, establishing teach-ins for education and dialogue, and creating self-governance built on transparency, dialogue, and consensus were inspirational beyond people's wildest dreams. Insofar as these practices did pose an alternative to pernicious aspects of neoliberal globalization, they were seen by some of the 1% as a dire threat, as needing to be destroyed. It is now up to our ingenuity, our imaginative ingenuity, to carry on these practices without the support of stable physical places. Snyder says that a place, quote, a place on earth is a mosaic within larger mosaics. The land is all small places, all precise, tiny realms replicating larger and smaller patterns, end of quote. Each of the encampments was one such small mosaic where participatory democratic principles were being practiced with the hope of their extension into the larger societal mosaics of which we are each a part. To restore the commons and to create new commons, we must attend to the creation of spaces where human relations can be regenerated. The same forces that have destroyed the commons have destroyed through violence, lies, deceit, corruption, and exploitation, the delicate interdependent ties between people within families and those most fragile membranes of exchange in the mind, where we, where we metabolize differences and recover psychic space for multiplicity, contradiction, ambiguity, and the unthought. Gustavo Esteva, he calls himself a deprofessionalized Mexican intellectual and activist, 
names intercultural dialogue as the main challenge of the 21st century and enjoins us to create cultural commons where we learn how to engage with the radical otherness of the other. He urges us to promote communism, not communism. Think about that. That's beautiful, isn't it? The former, communism, goes beyond the nation state, beyond socialism and communism. Instead of waiting for the utopia over there, he says, we can create it in our own place. Once freed from the discourse on socialism and capitalism, he says, there can be an explosion of the imagination. Unlike fundamentalist-minded communities that close off their borders completely, the localism he is advocating develops interrelations with other commons that are also learning how to live sustainably and vibrantly with one another. Such commons are based on hospitality instead of development. Esteva names three pillars for their recovery, friendship, hope, and surprise. He values the coming together of two and three people and the gathering of 200 and 300, 2,000 and 3,000, two and three million. Snyder offers his advice about where to start in this recovery. He says, the sum of a field's forces becomes what we call very loosely the spirit of the place. To know the spirit of a place is to realize that you are a part of a part and that the whole is made of parts, each of which is whole. You start with the part you are whole in. This beautiful passage challenges us to focus on those places marked by spaciousness where our totality is welcomed. Thich Nhat Hanh and Daniel Berrigan call such places communities of resistance. By resistance, they mean, quote, opposition to being invaded, occupied, assaulted, and destroyed by the system, end of quote. The purpose of resistance here is to seek the healing of oneself and one's community in order to be able to see clearly. Such local efforts of renewal are crucial to the regeneration of solidarity and the transformation that is before us. Thich Nhat Hanh says, quote, I think that communities of resistance should be places where people can return to themselves more easily, where the conditions are such that they can heal themselves and recover their wholeness, end of quote. This was clearly happening in the Occupy movement encampments last fall and continues in many of its working groups and general assemblies. Amid and in opposition to violence and injustice, it's necessary for people to join together to create communities where justice and peace on a small scale are possible. This allows those who participate as well as those who visit to experience that life is possible, that a future is possible. Snyder quotes a Klingit elder, Austin Hammond, who describes empires and civilizations as glaciers, saying that when these alien forces advance as in industrial civilization, that, quote, settled people can wait it out. To do so, one must be part of a community of resistance and have access to the long and deep time in which changes accrue and can manifest true transformative potentialities. The recovery of the commons is a form of what's been called alter globalization, an alternative to exploitative forms of globalization. It requires a corollary recovery and recreation of dialogical practices that mend the fabric of community. Esteva suggests our unit of understanding be the commons and not the person. To meet the possibility of the commons, people, you and me, must create psychic and social spaces which we can unfurl ourselves in, where our bodily being can recuperate a sense of well-being and vitality, where we can unfold our thoughts, images, and desires with one another and listen to other peoples to find modes of thinking and acting in solidarity for the sake of creating a far more sustainable and vibrant set of ways of living. 
These are the psychological and relational capacities that must be built to reclaim the commons. The task of my words today is to offer thoughts on leadership in this context, in the context of reseizing the commons in an era of gross income disparities. So we're going to take a short uh, three to four minute mini conversation with your partner, and I'd like you to take up the question of what kinds of leadership will support people's reoccupation of the commons in your imagination. What do you see? And uh, partner A, share your thoughts for like two minutes, and then I'll tell you when to turn to partner B and share, partner B will share, then we'll go back to part two. Go. <laughs> Okay, let's, let's come back together. A little spark of a conversation, thank you. So part two, um, Paulo Freire on revolutionary leadership. When Carol's invitation to me came across the email, I was uh, reading the chapter in, in Pedagogy of the Oppressed that uh, addresses revolutionary leadership probably reading it for the 35th time as I prepared to teach it. And so I thought, well, that's a good synchronicity. <laughs> There's nobody I, I have respected more in terms of thinking about leadership than he. So I'm, many of you may have read his books earlier on. How many have read Freire? Good, excellent. So I'll be reminding you of some things. Um, as you know, he grew up in Northeast Brazil. Uh, was in the middle class as a young child, but the depression in the United States in uh, 29 hit Brazil rather hard. He fell into poverty overnight, his family, and he would sit in school, uh, unable to concentrate, feeling intense feelings of hunger. And he forged an intention as a very young boy that he would grow up and work on issues of hunger. Uh, he did, but, but uh, he boiled it down, he crystallized the situation that uh, he needed to help people with their hunger to read and to write, um, not only to read in the literal sense, though absolutely that also, but to be able to read, to decode the social situations that our lives are part of, 
to read them, to decode them, so that we can realize that they're constructed, that they aren't, that it isn't this way out of just a sense of uh, this is naturally the way things are and therefore there's nothing we can do. We must meet it with a sense of fatalism. But that rather to learn to decode the situation you're in gives you the tools to then imagine how you would like it differently, to know how you can pull it apart, to act on it, to intervene in it, and to create in its loo. Um, Frere uh, trained as a lawyer but took on one case for free and gave up law after that. Uh, and he, he began his work in literacy training. Um, but one night he went to a community gathering and he gave a talk on what he saw as the problems of the community and how they should solve it. And when he got home that night, uh, he realized that his wife who had come with him, Ilsa, um, was in a very grumpy mood. And uh, he, he then began to realize that she was mad at him. And he, he said, well, why are you upset? You know, I went there, I said smart things, I shared what I saw, and I told them what to do. <laughs> and uh, Ilsa, Ilsa said, you know, um, yes, you, you've done a good job um, in, in that way, but by doing that, you failed to listen to anybody in the room. You failed to really understand at a deeper level what they were going through or any of their imagination of how things could be changed. Well, Freire realized that he had been um, trained to educate in what he came to call a banking model, which is that you have the solutions here and you're depositing it into your students and their goal is to replicate it, to mimic it, to parrot it. And uh, that's called success. Well, he began to see that he wanted to form a pedagogy not um, for the oppressed, but of the oppressed, with, with the oppressed. Um, and he said uh, some years later, those who steal the words of others develop a deep doubt in the ability of the others and consider them incompetent. Each time they say their word without hearing the word of those whom they have forbidden to speak, they grow more accustomed to power and acquire a taste for guiding, ordering, and commanding. In 1961, he was asked to initiate a literacy program that would involve teaching five million people previously denied education by institutions of neocolonialism. As in the United States, where it was forbidden to teach slaves how to read and write, such deprivation was used in Northeast Brazil to disempower the masses and make claims of their inferiority easier. Such claims then rationalized abuses of laborers as they do in the United States still. The majority were consigned to conditions of poverty, malnutrition, and illness in order that a few in power could profit. In 62, Ferry directed a project where 300 rural farm workers were taught to read and write in 45 days. And we've seen these amazing kind of campaigns in Cuba as well. In 1963, President Goulart invited Freire to rethink Brazil's approach to literacy and to coordinate the National Literacy Plan. He and his colleagues set up 200,000 cultural circles to host the emergence into literacy of two million Brazilians. Now, of course, these cultural circles did include the kind of decoding of social reality that I referred to and when a coup happened that replaced Goulard with a repressive military government, Freire was uh, thrown into prison. He was called an international subversive, a traitor to Christ and the Brazilian people, uh, accused of trying to make Brazil a Bolshevik country um, by helping people learn to read and write. While in prison, Freire grasped more deeply the essential connections between education and politics. The landowners had understood that through education, the peasants would become aware of their social situation and begin to organize to improve it. Well, his, his book uh, was finished when he was placed into exile, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. It was translated into dozens of languages and it was banned in most Latin American countries and in, and in Spain during the years of his exile. His method has now affected critical dialogical practices on all continents, and I am so surprised that no matter where I go in the world, when I go to sit in on community projects, 
they are oftentimes using Freirean techniques of dialogue. But I've, I've just used the wrong word, because by dialogue, Freire was not referring to a technique. He asserted that, quote, dialogue characterizes an epistemological relationship, an epistemological relationship. Dialogue is a way of knowing. I engage in dialogue because I recognize the social and not merely individualistic character of the process of knowing. In this sense, he says, dialogue presents itself as an indispensable component of the process of both learning and knowing. And in particular, to understand social situations of which we're a part, dialogue is absolutely essential because otherwise we begin to take our own personal situation as being created by ourselves, generated by ourselves, and not be able to see the larger context of which we're a part. He was insistent that we be careful not to assume that our dream is the dream of the people that we're working with. The methodology he developed to avoid this was one of asking generative questions, questions that provoke insight, deep listening with others, shared critical reflection, prophetic imagination, and experiments together in action to transform aspects of reality from undesirable states to more desirable states, desirable in the sense of that being determined by consensus among people. We see aspects of his method in action in the Occupy movement. This repeating cycle of critical reflection, itself in action, and the actions that emerge from this reflection can be found all over the world today. Together, members of a group move from developing critical consciousness and imagining what is desired in common and then moving into transforming actions forged in solidarity. The more schooling most of us receive, the more we're taught to identify with being experts and leaders. Freirean practice helps us to disidentify from the injunctions of expertism common to a competitive and individualistic culture and to explore and enact dialogical methodologies that help people think together his work is at the heart of my own theorizing, community practice, and participatory research. So it's here I will begin in Freire's own work on revolutionary leadership. Unless people see themselves and are seen by others as capable of critical reflection, creative imagination, and transformative action, their thinking and action will be co-opted and manipulated by leaders of the elites who esteem their own thoughts and self-serving goals more than those of others. Struggles engaged in will not be truly revolutionary, but domination in a different set of clothes. Liberation requires that my action and reflection be placed alongside that of others and put into creative dialogue with theirs. Ferry says that, quote, manipulation, sloganizing, depositing, regimentation, and prescription cannot be components of revolutionary praxis precisely because they are the components of the praxis of domination." End of quote. Revolutionary praxis is at the heart, is, is at its heart, dialogical practice, for it is only in engaging in dialogue that those who have been subjugated can claim their role as subjects as subjects of their own transformation. He asserts that, quote, dialogue with the people is radically necessary to every authentic revolution. This is what makes a revolution as distinguished from a military coup. Sooner or later, a true revolution must initiate a courageous dialogue with the people. Its very legitimacy lies in that dialogue. The earlier dialogue begins, he says, the more truly revolutionary the movement will be. Dialogue is the essence of revolutionary action." End of quote. One does not deny dialogue to accomplish a revolution, thinking, well, after the struggle, dialogue will begin. The very foundation of authentic revolution is dialogue. Revolution requires what he calls actors in intercommunication, as we are essentially, he says, communicative creatures. Freire remarks on the courage it takes for leaders to be in, quote, humble, loving, and courageous encounter with the people. In authentic revolution, leaders do not appoint themselves. They are authenticated through their praxis by the people. 
He argues that the educational dialogical quality of revolution, which makes it a cultural revolution as well, must be present in all its stages, end of quote, and that this helps to safeguard the revolution from becoming reactionary. We see presently in our own culture enormous resources deployed to create a culture of entertainment, partaken alone or with one or two others. Being entertained through consumerism of products and media, one is lulled into passivity and deprived of opportunities for developing creative thinking and engagement in dialogue. The status quo is not problematized, but presented as static and fixed. The use of the imagination is hijacked, deployed away from rehearsing for other ways of being, and invested instead in disrupting any resistance to the status quo. Dialogue is not used for the sake of revolution. It is the revolution. Struggle that preempts dialogue is counter-revolutionary. The lofty goals of revolution must begin in our relations with one another in our family, in our workplace, our community, in conversation with neighbors and members of groups from whom we are estranged. There is a great temptation to skip over dialogue for the presumable sake of dialogue later, but there is no shortcut. A struggle that skips over dialogue, failing to make it a foundational building block, becomes another oppressive reality in which people are deprived of exercising their own subjecthood, their capacity to create and to transform their world. Freire is clear that anti-dialogue is oppression and is necessary to the maintenance of oppression. The oppressors deposit myths in the minds of the people, myths that mislead, confuse, obscurate, and miseducate. We have liberated Iraq. This is a crisis and requires a temporary curtailing of human rights for the sake of our security. Banking regulation is bad for the economy and hurts everyone. Voting is the principal responsibility of a citizen. Capitalism is necessary for democracy. Those engaged in critical dialogue wrestle with these myths in an attempt to see reality more clearly, to determine who and what the myths serve, and to present alternative ways of understanding and of living with one another. None of this is possible without dialogue. That messy process that challenges us to look directly into the partiality and wrongheadedness of our own thoughts. It's a process that requires our patience to temper our thoughts by hearing out those who hold widely differing perspectives. It requires us to listen most closely to those we have cast as our enemies, as they are most often, as Jean Knudsen Hoffman taught us here in Santa Barbara, those whose stories we have not yet heard. Isn't that beautiful? An, an enemy is one whose stories you have not yet heard. So Freire's work helps us delineate some of the essential qualities of revolutionary leaders whose work is the recovery of the commons. And I'm going to just summarize some of those. A revolutionary leader holds the common good of people, animals, and earth as her highest aim. He died with the uh, draft of the Earth Charter on his bedside table. A revolutionary leader takes care to craft generative questions. This empowers others to develop their own understandings. A revolutionary leader listens deeply. This allows her to hear others' understandings of their own dilemmas and dreams. A revolutionary leader is inclusive. He learns how to help each member of a group make a contribution to the understanding at hand. He does not disempower through enacting a banking model of education. A revolutionary leader has faith in the people in their capacity to reflect, to create new knowledge, and to pose imaginative solutions that will inform their actions together. The revolutionary leader knows that when lived realities are presented as fixed and static, that they are being construed as such by people for certain purposes. When these purposes are for the sake of exploitation, he knows he must work to demystify to see through, in Hillman's terms, the situation he finds himself in, penetrating and dispelling the ideologies that have gone unquestioned. Having listened intently to people's experiences, a revolutionary leader must have the courage to announce what characterizes 
the epoch that one is living in, aware that these very words may risk one's security and at times even one's life. Leadership for the sake of the commons and courage need to be linked. The revolutionary leader knows the power of imagination to exceed the known, and she invites others to look past oppressive realities to dream of other ways to structure our relations. A revolutionary leader has integrity. There's congruency between his vision and his manner of being, his practices and his goals. The work he does and the manner in which he pursues it are consonant with his deepest understandings of what is needed and what is important in the world that we share. He creates with others in the present the kind of world they want to see more broadly. A revolutionary leader has clarity about his own social location and its potential limits on his understanding. He does not seek for others to replicate his exact understandings and methods. He's not interested in the universalizing of what he knows, but in fostering the creative generativity of all people in their local circumstances. Now, Jean Sharp, um, whose study of nonviolent revolutionary struggle has been used around the world, and most recently by the Arab Spring movement, defines leadership qualities for nonviolent revolutionaries that are consistent with Ferry's insights. In some nonviolent struggles, it is, he says, difficult or impossible at various stages to identify who the leaders are, if indeed there are any, except locally and temporarily. Analysis re is required of the possibility that wide diffusion of knowledge of nonviolent struggle, including its dynamics and requirements, may greatly reduce the need for identifiable leadership in actual struggles. Certain qualities should be taken into account when selecting leaders, he says. Leaders should set the example, know their people, and look out for their welfare. Be technically and tactically proficient. Seek out and accept responsibility. Let others get credit for success. Observe loyalty to superiors and subordinates. Know the opponents. Learn from the experience of one's own group and other, others as well. Maximize and challenge the abilities of subordinates and pick the right people for the right positions. Very importantly, he says the leaders should either have significant knowledge of nonviolent struggle and be capable of wise strategic planning or have the judgment and humility to rely on other persons with those qualities for strategic direction, end of quote. To join this conversation on leadership here at this conference, I borrowed Freire's term revolutionary leadership, but it's possible that the language of leadership may mislead us. Freire called the revolutionary leader an animator. I think that's a lovely word, an animator. One responsible for helping a group decode their reality and thus for problem posing and asking of generative questions. African-American women leaders from the Deep South, such as Ella Baker, call such a revolutionary leader a cultural worker. Cultural workers are committed to developmentally-oriented leadership that has as its aim creating environments in which people can grow in their thinking with one another and are affirmed in their qualities and strengths. Scholar-activist Barbara Omelad understands this kind of developmentally-oriented leadership as, quote, originating in African tribal societies organized around democratic consensus processes, end of quote. Others use the word facilitator. Some use the term maternal leadership, as the revolutionary leader is, develop, is devoted, says Mary Belinke, to promoting the development of the most vulnerable members of society, end of quote. She's likened to a midwife, to one who can listen others into speech. She's seen as a bridge between people and communities. Patricia Hill Collins describes her as a community other mother. An other mother in African-American communities is one who treats those who are unrelated biologically as members of his or her own family. Such an other mother expresses an ethic of care and personal accountability, which is intended to provide uplift and act as an antidote to domination and control. Now I'm just checking my time to see if I, I have time. We have another four minute conversation before the third part. Now, when you, my question to you this time is when you take part 
in a group where there's an issue that you hold very close to your heart, what kind of a facilitating leader or presence do you want in the room? What are the qualities that you deeply value? Ready, set, go. <laughs> Okay, let's come, let's come back together. Thank you. So last part, part three, um, facilitating leadership and the Occupy movement. So last fall, while living in New York City, I visited Zakoti Park regularly, and after the police's destruction of Occupier's encampment, I visited the atrium a large space where Occupy working groups convene each day. Occupy is challenging casino capitalism, and in doing so, forming resistance to the most powerful influences on the planet today. They need our support. How this is being done is worthy of separate discussion. I, however, am going to drop below this level of action and focus on the processes by which Occupy is addressing proposals for action. In New York City, I studied how facilitation occurs in both the General Assembly and in the working groups. I engaged in facilitation trainings and was part of the discussions where facilitation occurred. I also witnessed conversations about breakdowns in communication and struggles to match dialogical processes to the goals of particular sessions. 
Occupy has been critiqued as a leaderless movement that will come to little if leaders do not emerge and if platforms are not crafted and widely published. The editorial board of the Northern Star complains that, quote, this basis of organization is leading the movement nowhere. We understand the protesters are disillusioned by political leaders because they account for a portion of the 1%. However, this horizontal structure of leadership lacks organization, and without organization, they will never get anything done. We realize the horizontal structure of the Occupy Wall Street movement was a popular mechanism used to draw in supporters, but this structure is unrealistic in the long term. This movement desperately needs a leader who can clearly articulate the group's goals. Well, what is missed in such a critique is what is being accomplished by being what is called a leaderful movement. That is by being inclusive of the emerging leadership of all members. By focusing on the practice of participatory democracy, occupiers are bringing into existence amongst themselves and for the world to see an alternative to the in-name only democracy we suffer under. Discussions are open. The workings of the movement are intentionally transparent. Notes of working groups are published on the internet for any interested party to see, knowing that there will be people seeing them that you might not want to have them see. There will not need to be a WikiLeak for the Occupy movement, <laughs> I hope. Careful training is given to members about the consensus process, its importance, and how to engage in it. They are taught a number of hand signals that help discussions to proceed in an inclusive and thoughtful and orderly manner. In Occupy Wall Street, the governance structure that has evolved is for the General Assembly, the GA, to decide broad issues. There are many working groups that meet regularly and contribute a representative to the Spokes Council. The Spokes Council handles day-to-day -day operations. I want to focus on the leadership for facilitated dialogue in Occupy. The point of facilitation is to create a space where many thoughts can be creatively and critically considered. The facilitator engages in multi-partiality for the sake of the process. His or her own opinion about the proposal under consideration is bracketed. The highest goal is participatory democracy, and the role of the facilitator is to create and safeguard the space in which this becomes possible. When a person or group has a proposal to bring to the GA, it is published on the website about 24 hours before the GA. The proposer gives a several sentence presentation that flushes out the proposal in terms of why it's needed. This cuts down on the need for clarifying questions. The facilitator, quote, opens stack, asking if anyone has questions about the proposal. A co-facilitating stack taker writes down the first names of the people who desire to speak, and then they proceed in order with one exception. Taking stack helps more people to enter into the dialogue and discernment, an innovation to help ensure that those who are traditionally marginalized, such as women and, quote, minorities, have a chance to speak more often is the use of progressive stack. Progressive stack allows you to put people in front who haven't spoken yet. The facilitator is mindful of what is called stack jumpers, individuals who present themselves as asking a clarifying question when they are actually trying to just speak and aren't waiting to wait, er, and aren't waiting for their turn to get onto stack. As clarifying questions wind down, the facilitator warns that questions will be closed after the next question and that the discussion will move to clarifications. After the proposal is understood, the assembly moves to make a space where concerns can be heard. The facilitator takes a temperature check to see if the group is moving toward consensus. If there seems to be more concerns, one can go back to taking stack and hearing from individual people. The facilitator can assess the situation and announce, we're moving toward consensus, are there any blocks? If so, each person who is blocking has a chance to speak on his or her objections to the proposal. This is a very important part of the process. When a group goes forward over and against others' deep objections, the outcome desired is often subverted. Also, the group is deprived of the potential wisdom and the ethical discernment that may be ingredient to the block. I think this insight is very much part of Arnie Mandel's practice of deep democracy. One person's voicing of the reasons behind his or her block 
can create greater ethical sensitivity in other members, leading to a better decision in the long run. This may lead to an amendment being proposed that will help lay the way for the block to be removed. A block is a serious concern with the proposal. Participants are warned that it should be considered a once-in-a-lifetime thing, not to be used casually. If after amendments have been forged, there are remaining blocks, the facilitator moves to see if a modified consensus has been reached. If a proposal achieves 90% agreement, while still having one or more blocks, the proposal is carried, while respecting the blocks. If it is less than 90%, those with concerns meet with those who crafted the proposal to possibly bring it back to the floor in a revised state. The New York um, Occupy Wall Street General Assembly began with a 75% modified consensus. Then they wanted to be stricter and have it closer to ideal consensus, now requiring 90%. We can each consent to something without it being that meaningful to us or feeling all that good about it. The hand signal of holding one's fingers down is still consent. If there's a lot of this lukewarm or cool reception, it should be picked up early in the temperature check. Participants learn that they can stand aside conveying, I disagree with this proposal, but I'm not going to block it. I'm not going to stand in its way. Once a proposal is tabled, participants are encouraged to stop talking about it and to go to the, on to the next item of business. The following is a summary of hand signals used in both GAs and working groups. And I'll just show you a few of them. Um, wiggling your fingers at eye level, uh, they say, like, imagine playing a tiny air guitar, says, I'm confused, I'm confused by what's going on. Um, this is to ask for clarification. Up twinkles is approval, these are also called sparkles in Quaker communities. Down, down twinkles, um, c concerns, not, not very keen on, on what's going on. Um, a, a block, a hard block is your hands raised up and crossed. Um, clarification, point of order that needs to be considered by the facilitators. So with, with these, um, there isn't a lot of screaming out. Um, the, the process, the conversation goes in a very orderly way and can, as all consensus processes, take quite a bit of time. But then again, um, what, is, what is gained is very significant because the decisions being made are strategic and, and important. Um, these are some of the roles. The facilitator, facilitators always work in a group, usually with four or five people with these various roles being um, taken up. A person who, who is the key facilitator for a meeting one night would not do it the next night. There's a rotation. There's an effort to get everybody trained in facilitation so that everybody can take on these roles so that even if you end up being in a very small working group, you can have the clarity of, of this process. In New York right now, um, these are some of the working groups. So you can see the, the diversity of things that people are working on. And at times, this group has been um, 70 to 100 different groups. There's a few less right now. And also, this one, a little heart. So if somebody has said something, and you want to send a little love their way, a little affection, it's a little heart. <laughs> um, this kind of sign language decision-making has become a staple of, of left-wing protests, um, says Klein, writing about this. He's, he has seen these um, used by European groups like Climate Camp, Seeds for Change, and UK Uncut, um, but says that they were showing up in protest manuals as early as 1994. So facilitators, uh, oh, I told you that part, okay, hold on. A key feature of Occupy Deliberations is horizontalidad, horizontalism, a term first used in Argentina in 2001 in the face of its economic crisis. This term has spread widely to places such as Spain, Greece, and to the Occupy movement in the US. Marina Citrin, editor of Horizontalism, Voices of Popular Power in Argentina, and part of the General Assembly that helped to organize Occupy Wall Street, has studied the use of horizontalism in current social movements around the globe. 
Turning to each other instead of to any governmental agency, Argentinians, as you probably know, organized themselves into popular assemblies in their neighborhoods. The unemployed organized themselves into general assemblies, as did workers displaced from closed factories. They sought new ways of anti-authoritarianism and anti-hierarchical self-organization to take on the functions that had been abandoned by business owners and the government. Horizontalism emphasizes the importance of efforts to communicate outside of vertical and hierarchical power structures. It is concerned with the, inclusion, with, with the inclusive practices of direct or participatory democracy and the building of consensus in particular. The practice of a horizontalidad, by its very difference, implies a cri critique of and a rupture with practices where the many are subjected to the decisions by a powerful few. Instead, people meet to discuss a situation or concern. They listen closely to each other, taking turns speaking. Horizontalidad is seen as a tool as well as a goal. In order for relationships to become free of the structures of hierarchy, people begin in the present to relate differently to one another. Horizontalidad is a possibility available to us in any moment, in any meeting or gathering that we're part of. It involves a reorientation away from traditional ways of exercising power over others and instead requires that we stand alongside others, creating together relationships that are graced by inclusivity, deep listening, and the communal discernment required by efforts at consensus. Consensus does not mean everyone agrees on all items of a plan or situation, but rather an agreement has been forged that has considered where there is disagreement, listening into minority positions and seeking common ground. Not all consensus situations are equal, as at times differences are breezed over and the group may be steered to a consensus that is hardly deep and will then probably be difficult to execute over time. The goal, however, is a durable consensus, strengthened by the care with which it has been constructed. Citroen has been impressed with not only how widely horizontalidad has spread, but how organically it has emerged in many different locations as people confront the pernicious effects of neoliberal capitalism. And I must say, in, in, in studying Occupy, I'm so surprised that so many of the dialogical um, approaches that we've been teaching here for years are, are just part of everyday activities, open space, um, nonviolent dialogue, um, council, consensus building. Um, it's as though they had been worked on in enough places like Pacifica that, that they've been able to just like osmotically go into the general culture and these are things that people have available to them now. Uh, she says, um, Citrin, the crux of the politics is that the point of reference is not above. It's not to the state. Instead, it is a cross. It involves looking to one another in horizontal ways. And from that vantage point, tactics and strategies are decided. End of quote. How am I doing on time? Okay, skip that part. Um, we can think of Occupy as a decolonizing movement. Instead of striving to take over others' places in order to own them oneself, as happened during and since the enclosure movement, Occupy seeks to liberate, privatize places of exclusion and return them to the majorities. Territory is seized to be released for the common good, not for the few against the many. Within the boundary of each liberated place, there is space for developing alternative systems of care medical care, child care, education, shelter, food security, communication, alternative economics, as you brought up earlier, which I th thank you for. These then can serve as exemplars of the incarnated possibilities this precarious period offers us and indeed demands of us. Leadership in horizontalidad is inseparable from facilitation. For the facilitating leader's job is to help guard the space for democratic group process. This opens the opportunity for each person to offer leadership. Leadership in Occupy will require taking the time to build modes of relationship where participants can glean the wisdom and contradictory perspectives and creatively metabolize differences. Facilitating leaders will expect conflict and welcome what can be learned from it 
while giving careful attention to avoid breakdowns in communication. At um, Occupy Wall Street, nonviolent communication workshops are given regularly to foster the skills to collaborate and de escalate conflict. Naomi Klein, author of The Shock Doctrine, addressed occupiers, saying, This time, let's treat each other as though we plan to work side by side and struggle for many, many years to come, because the task before us requires nothing less. The leadership skills required by Occupy include the formation of solidarities with diverse groups and causes, such as the homeless, immigrants, union members, veterans, young men of color affected by the New York Police Department's Stop and Frisk program, evicted homeowners, and many others. The diversity of groups coming in to take part in the dialogue is part of the excitement and also part of the challenge of, of the movement. The message from Occupy is that we can each be a revolutionary leader among other revolutionary leaders in the small and large mosaics that are given to us in our day-to-day -day life. From the intrapsychic hosting of disparate inner voices to the nonviolent communications needed in the home, from hosting democratic processes in the workplace that can include participatory budgeting, to the neighborhood block council and the occupation of the town square, the revolution is rooted in how we are with one another. Revolutionary leadership asks integrity from us, that we do not promote dialogue in one sphere, only to close it down in others, that we do not seek the common good only in the small vessel of the family and amongst those similar to ourselves, but also in the workplace, on the other edge of the town, in the nation and abroad. Only a quest for this manner of integrity will begin to right our wrongs, for we know that we cannot afford to take literally the metaphor of the 99% against the 1%. For we are all implicated in the interlocking crises of democracy, of ecological demise, and spiraling violence that confront us. The reclaiming of the commons must go hand in hand with the process of psychic decolonization, where the received hierarchical roles and practices we have inherited are disrupted, thrown into question, including even those of leadership. This is happening all over the world as autonomous communities develop from two and three to several thousand to thousands. The Zapatistas in southern Mexico imagine that one day these autonomous zones, these commons, will be so numerous on earth that they will finally create a global shift. But recovering our commons proceeds small mosaic by small mosaic. The revolutionary leader of our time must be a facilitating leader. He and she must embrace humility and engender hope that what is possible among a few here and more there can gradually bloom widely and heartily in the fields we need to recover as our shared commons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for letting me bring these, these thoughts here. Now, I want to hear from you, because I had to be up here all alone by myself while you were having good sparks of conversations. 